Yes, welcome back to How Did I Get Here? This is the Student Edge podcast where we're asking the question, how did you get here? I'm going to launch right into it because I'm very excited about today's guest. I've got in front of me Will Schofield, 194 games for the Eagles, premiership player, podcast host these days, he's in the media. Will, thanks for being here today. And more importantly, your co-worker, Will co-worker? Schofield. Yeah, co-worker. Hello, Charlie. How are you, mate? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to be here. How did I get here? I don't know. How did you get here? Well, let's find out. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go straight into it. You, you grew up in Geelong. Um, oh, we've seen so much recently, like Geelong celebrating the grand final. How big is footy culture in Geelong? Um, so, I mean, my childhood was um, was pretty pretty footy based. Uh, we used to sit um, about three rows back at Kidinia Park, right where the bench was. It was actually opposition bench. So, from about four years old, we went to every game down at Kidinia Park, right through till I was probably in year 10, 11. I started, you know, a lot of footy commitments started coming up, so I didn't get to go to the games. But so, 90, so 89, I was born in 89, and then. 92, 94, 95, all losing grand finals. We had the, they had the house um, strapped up in um, streamers, blue and white streamers, newspaper clippings, there'd be parades. So like, there was a lot of success in Geelong, but like, never the ultimate success. Like I never got to see Geelong with a premiership as a fan. So I mean, my childhood was based around sport, not just footy. It was, it was sporting country, you know, sporting town. Uh, what was the player you were looking at? Back in those days, as an inspiration player, Darren Milburn, Darren number Milburn. thirty-nine. Um, he was a player that maybe not many people know too much about. He once um, absolutely pulverised a Carlton favourite son in Stephen Silvani on the MCG, and he um, gave the one sing- one finger salute to the crowd on the way off. So I kind of um, liked his white line fever. He was mm. a dour defender. He could win his own ball and run and carry a bit, but he wasn't like the superstar kind of guy. Matty Scarlett was always someone I looked up to as well, but um, Darren Milburn. Yeah. I know you were a pretty handy runner early on as well. It was a big event. I think it was under nines, was it? Well, mate, I could go through the list. I, yeah. how, how long have we got? Oh, we got plenty of under time. Under eights, under nines, it. under twelve. Still hold the four by eight record at my school at Chillon College. Four by eight record hurdling as well. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. State champion under nine hurdles. Um, Daniel Venables has got a quicker time than me though. But uh, yeah, athletics was kind of. Um, I probably was probably was more athletics bound through my junior years than footy. I was a yeah. runner. Um, that four by eight hundred at the APS finals is probably ranked second. Second or third in like all time sporting moments for me, so I did really used to love the ath, you know, the aths and the co- competition side and the um, yeah, the, the winning. Like I, I, I still do like love to win. I, I didn't used to like the training. Didn't yeah. like training as an AFL player either, and athletics provided that for me. So um, used to love that. You you mentioned that it was second there. Is the premiership up first? Yeah, premiership's first. You can, I don't think you can go past that yeah. hundred hundred thousand people. Second time around too. The circumstances around that for me personally, um, I've been through a pretty tough year in twenty eighteen, and to get it done, it was I've never been able to replicate that feeling. But yeah. outside of that, it's probably you know first game, big feeling. That's a bit numb though. That one you sort of just you know sort of like this podcast. You're like I don't know how I got here, <laughs> uh, and then the four by eight. I don't know. It was just it was in front of a big crowd for a year twelve. I was captain at athletics and anchored anchored a team to a gold medal and still hold a school record from that race. Captain ath- athletics. I didn't know that one. Absolutely, mate. So, so we talked about the athletics, but how much of a role did footy play? Like, how much of your life did it take up during high school? Honestly, it wasn't a huge part um, of my uh, life. Like, my, my life was bought based around sport. And, I, you know, when I talk to kids now, I do say that I learn a lot of my life lessons from sport, you know, not just athletic lessons and being physical. But, you know, you learn to work in teams. You learn about leadership. You learn about being a good person. You know, you learn about winning and losing. Like, I get caught up a bit with the young kids these days not keeping scores. Like, it's important mm-hmm. in life to understand about winning and losing you don't always win like things don't always go your way so if you're always told that a oh, good try give it your best effort in real life i don't know who's gonna be listening to this but real life you don't always win yeah. and that's okay but if you're not taught that from a young age it's difficult so sport sport was big in that in that sense for me um footy didn't become a you know reality i always wanted to play footy full time but didn't become reality probably till year 11, year 12. I just used to enjoy playing it. So I know you've spoken about there was actually an opportunity to go down the athletics path instead of the footy path. There might have been a scholarship opportunity thrown up there. How, how did you make the decision or was the decision made for you? 
Um, our mum gave Mick Turner a call down at the uh, Geelong Falcons footy factory. I hadn't been selected in the under-16 squad down there. And at the same time, I'd been invited to go to Europe to run. Um, uh, it was basically a European tour of a select group of Victorian athletes that um, a guy took over every year and was going to do the European circuit for three months, which would have taken me out of school as a year 10, year 11 kid, which would have been a big commitment. I don't know if mum wanted me doing that, so she gave Mick Turner a call, who runs the Geelong Falcons, Mick Turner Footy Factory, and not the rest is history, but I got my opportunity there. I always enjoyed team sports more than individual as well. It's always something um, I think more special that doing it with people than achieving things by yourself. When you're in like year 11 and 12, how did you go about like managing footy, athletics, studying? How did you balance all that? Yeah, I was... Um, not that I'm a, an enigma or anything or a, or a standout, but I definitely um, prioritised my schooling in front of sport. Like, sport was always a big part of my life and I used to love it, but I was pretty hell-bent on um, having an option if footy didn't work out. And it was a bit to do with footy not always being an option, but um, it was a bit to do with that competitive nature that I have and it, like, extended into my schooling. Like, I wanted to do the best I could. Um, I wanted to study law, which, which required... a Pretty big end to score. Mm. And, um, yeah, I was pretty proud at the end of it. Look, I get drafted at the, just after school finishes and, and I actually got drafted before the results came out. But, you know, post, post getting drafted, got the results. And I would have been able to do what I wanted to do, which was go to law school. And, I don't know, could have been your defence barrister at some point in time, Charlie. <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. Um, what was your first ever job? Uh, glassy. glassy. I, was a, I was a Glassy down at the Torquay pub. I'm happy to say it's my – it's uh, like um, other than footy um, before what I'm doing now, it was my only job. Mm. Um, I didn't have any other job. I was a glassy in – when I was 16, I uh, wanted to go to schoolies. And mum and dad said you can go to schoolies if you pay for it. So schoolies in um, in Victoria, you go to Byron Bay, or our, our group of friends did. So I had to pay for my flights, my accommodation. And, um, yeah, glassy at the Torquay Hotel, got to see uh, – uh, Paul Kelly play, got to see a few few guys play and just be that little 16 little Grom carrying around the glasses. Dropped a few as well. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. But yes, oh, pretty, pretty good experience. How would you go as a glassy? You'd be dropping them all over the place. I, I have broken a few glasses Sorry. in my time. I know you're the one answer, asking the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. It, it taught me, well, it was just a different environment and like learning about um, working in a different team, different personalities, not necessarily motivated by a goal of winning the premiership like you are in footy. Like, that's a big thing about footy is there's always something to work towards, whereas I guess what I've learnt post-footy and also probably in my time as a glassy, it's difficult to motivate people if there's not, like, that that golden chalice at the end of it all. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, on reflection. I haven't really thought about my time there other than right now, but that's probably what I learnt. There you go. Uh, so draft comes after high school, but you go to the draft combine first. What's the experience of being, what, you were probably 17 going to the draft combine like? I was pretty. I was pretty nervous. I was pretty scared. I was um, like, I was an athlete, and I was you know 195 centimeters. I grew a lot in the last couple of years at school. So I was, I was probably a prospect rather than like I wasn't a top ten pick. So I kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I felt I felt like I was a bit out of place, but I also wanted to do really well. Um, you, you find yourself in different situations. I remember Mark Williams, the coach of Port Adelaide at the time. I reckon I was the first kid ever interviewed at draft camp. He grabbed me on the first night. We, like, arrived, had dinner, and he grabbed me out of the dinner hall. He was like, come to this room. I was like, what is going on here? Put me down, sat me down. Didn't say anything to me. Put a laptop in front and said, tell me about this play. He played a piece of vision. He said, tell me what you see. It was someone kicking out, and, you know, in hindsight, it was about decision-making, right? And I was watching it, scared out of my brain. No idea what was going on. And played it. I said, he said, what, what should the kicker have done? Uh, first I said kick long to this person nah kick short to this person nah I had another go nah and, and he was like can you see it and I was like nah there was uh, there was no one on the mark and so he wanted to say play on take it down the middle but I was scared conservative and uh, never got drafted by Port Adelaide <laughs> got to imagine it's probably pretty scary sitting in a room with Mark Williams when yes. you're that young uh, so post combine uh, you're looking to the draft what's, what's your feeling like ahead of draft night and on draft night uh, head of draft night, I called my manager in tears saying I didn't want to okay. didn't want to get drafted into state. Had a girlfriend at the time, very closely connected to her, I felt, um, which looking back is humorous. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to go and tell Melbourne clubs I'm not coming to Melbourne. I just wanted to stay in Geelong. So it's interesting now, you know, looking at guys like Horn Francis right now or, or different guys that want to stay around. Like, I do understand that 
can empathise it. But you know, the best thing that ever happened to me was go to West Coast, um, get out of town. I was a pretty mature kid. I had a couple of older brothers, one 12 years older, one 18 years older. So I was always around older people. Um, and, you know, I still remember my best mate. I asked, he came over to my house. He was the only person that came around. I said, do you reckon I'm going to get drafted? He was like, no, nah, you're no chance. <laughs> um, got picked 50 and, yeah, away we go. So I never let him forget that. I actually, um, there's a, uh, I did, a, when we won the flag in 18, I, did, I, got, I, got, I got all my mates a signed jumper, 2018. Uh, premiership side and on the back of his so it's framed it says remember when you told me I wasn't going to get drafted so it can, that, it can suck on. on those ones that'll show up <laughs> did you reckon you were going to get picked up yeah I, I thought I was um, yeah. but I've always been a pretty confident and, and you know um, I, I guess yeah confident in my own ability yeah. I think you've got to be it's not, it's not arrogance but to make it uh, to begin with you need to understand your capabilities and then to stay in the game for a long time it's not really about skill or ability um, with, you know, how you go about it in, in that sense. It's more your mindset and the mental element of it. Yeah. So you head to West Coast, get picked up at pick 50. West Coast, which is just coming off the 2006 Premiership. Yep. What's it like adjusting to a professional footy club, especially one that's just won a Premiership? Oh, I mean, I loved it. I was, uh, I was pretty fit, had the athletics background, so came into this um, team that... Um, they had a midfield group of cousins, Judd, Kerr, Braun, Fletcher, Stengline, Cox, Embley, you know, this incredible group. And we got drafted. Um, they, they went really athletic with the draft we got. To. So we just – Tim Houlihan was like a national champion at 1,500. He was drafted with me. James Thompson was my side, a great runner. Eric McKenzie was drafted with me. And we're all these tall guys and we got dumped with the midfield group. And um, they were in shock. I think it was a good thing, right? We were, we were good runners. We worked hard. You know, learned a lot from – um, at the time, the best in the business. Now, it didn't didn't go the way over that period of time for the club that they would have wanted. But for me, it was it couldn't have been in a better environment. Like you don't want to lob it at, at a club that's struggling and get a hundred games in your first four years, in yeah. my opinion. Because what do you learn? You're just getting gifted games. Mm. Yeah. So that's kind of the next question is you know you, you get picked up in the draft late in 2006 and then you debut in round 17 of the next year. What's the interim period like? Like, yeah, I mean, you, you, I played um, with Peel, so basically you get a, um, you do a redraft for interstate draft days. So I was drafted down at Peel. I didn't have any other West Coast players down there, so I think a lot of other players would have struggled with it at the time. Like I was driving down there once a week for training on a Thursday night, um, just to be around the players to get to know guys, and then playing down there every second weekend. A lot of guys would have struggled, but I had the Geelong Melbourne sort of trip through my last couple of years at home. So it was pretty similar. Um, pure shit. Like, we were so bad. And, um, yeah, that, <laughs> that that taught me about, you know, it, it was a good environment being. Muddy Waterman was my coach, um, West Coast Premiership player um, of 94, 92, and he really gave me the reins a bit. And it, it developed me as a player. But, you know, you, you're pretty much just waiting for your chance because you're in a good team. You're not, you're not going to get a gift at anything. Mm. You get the call up for a game against Bulldogs in round 17. What's you feeling like then? I didn't come on until halfway through the second quarter, yeah. so they didn't know what rotations were back in 2007. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't great, but it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty epic. Um, debut at home as well. Played, um, played something like three of my first six or seven games against the Bulldogs. Um, <laughs> like the Eddie, Eddie had specialists there at one <laughs> stage. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it, you know, game one ranks up there with... Probably um, top three moments of sporting sporting life, but at the end of it all, sporting life is probably different to life. There's there's different elements for sure. What a segue that was because you do debut, and that's how you got there as a footy player. Mm. We're going to move towards your kind of post footy career, but before we do, I know you studied throughout uni. How do you manage like uni study and playing professional footy? Yeah, I did a fair bit of stuff while I was playing. Um, I really never had an idea of what I was going to do. Even right right at the end, I was still you know, figuring it out in my last year of footy. So, like I said, I worked really hard in year twelve. As you know, I got drafted as a bottom age seventeen year old. So I was seventeen in Victoria, which I know that's the norm over here in WA. But Victoria, you're eighteen in year twelve. So I came over, went straight into commerce law at UWA, and um, I really struggled with the timetable. To be honest. Um, it's probably only enough time to do one unit. If you want to do two, you're really stretching yourself. So 
I probably knocked over four units in three years, which mm. is you know, not ideal, but you are getting paid to be an elite something in another industry. So it would be like being a doctor and going and studying um, to be a plumber or going to do TAFE while you're doing surgery. Like, you know, the elite industry of, of something. Now, I know it's sport, but you're still the best in the country at it. So yeah. although I tried to balance, you know, working hard off the field, um, I, I did need to give my full focus to what I was doing. So studied law. I did a lot of work experience. I, started, I worked for a year with a PR firm. I worked for a year at an accounting firm and a recruitment firm, like all sort of year stints, made good relationships there and a lot of contacts at the club as well that in hindsight I've been able to, you know, wrong words probably leverage, but really use coming out of the game to to help me succeed in what I've wanted to do. But like the, the journey was never clear for me. And it like it's probably similar for students or you know, people going through life at a young age. It's no different for a footy player. You, you do have You do have elements that are, you know, I guess easier than, being a uni student but it's no different in a sense that you got to balance what you're doing you know uh, outside of uni in uni you know holding a job elsewhere like it's a balancing act so I learn a bit but I still haven't finished my degree <laughs> um, I've done I've swapped it around a few times as well I think I've done 22 units of 34 don't think I'll ever finish it at this stage we'll, we'll, we'll see if you get there okay. but um Why need so your you help you finish footy, sort of, you finish up with AFL at the end of the 2020 season, play a bit of waffle in 2021. But uh, what I wanted to ask about is, you know, you've spoken before about some of the challenges about transitioning out of the footy world. Is there more support that can be given to players as they leave? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, but, but it's also not a sob story, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, AFL players get every opportunity while you're in the game. Um, the AFLPA is a great resource, um, you, you know, it comes down to the individual in the end. Like, there's only so much help that you can get. And this isn't just AFL, this is people in general. There's only so much help people can offer you. And you can be given support, you can be given numbers to call, you can be given, you know, direct job opportunities, but it's up to you to take them. So whether you're a hard worker, whether you're lazy, whether you're smart, whether you're dumb, wherever you fit, it's about how, how much you want to put in, really. So coming out of footy, yeah, it's bloody hard because you, you finish in an industry where... There is no, there is no recourse to go and be a AFL elite player at fifty years old. There's no recourse to be thirty five unless you're David Mundy. So, it's it's a it's a pretty unique industry in the fact that it ends at 30, 31, 32. and when you're in the job and you're thirty two years old, you're looked at as like a, a grandpa. Yeah. Whereas in a you know usual workplace, thirty two years old, you probably just started. You, you, you're probably just gaining experience. So, really unique in that sense. So when you do come out. Um, there's a huge shift in your lifestyle, in your mindset, in, you know, you don't have the schedule, it's such a regimented schedule as an athlete. When you come out of that, it's great, but it's also, you know, you feel a bit lost at stages. You know, what do you do? Where do you go? You've got so much free time. You know, what do you actually put it towards? What's your driver? Because at footy, it's a premiership. It's easy. It's like work your ass off, win a premiership. That's, it's not a, it's not a, difficult realm AFL to figure out what you need to do whereas you get into the real world and um, what's the goal like what's what mountain are you climbing yeah it's infinite you had a few different roles post footy we'll get into media just in a bit but you've had a couple businesses business ventures as well uh, let's see how you go hero, yeah. comrades and heroes heroes and comrades very good heroes and comrades HB go yes I'm missing one oh they're missing a few missing actually a few. We'll, we'll tell us about about your business ventures post it's been interesting. I mean, like during footy as well, I've been entrepreneurial sort of my whole life, really. I've, I've always enjoyed business. So um, so my wife started Studio Equilibro, which is a Pilates studio. So I helped her set that up from the back end. I've always been a closet nerd. And when I say closet, probably not, just a nerd that plays footy, really. I love computers. I love building websites. I love social media. I love gaming, all of that stuff. So I started applying my trade a little bit there. Um, so she's you know, running a really successful business now. I then sort of turned that around, partnered with a mate in my back end of 2020 and um, started a digital marketing agency called HB Go, just up the road actually on Hay Street. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it was really successful. 12 months we, we signed sort of over 20 clients and we probably hit a pretty sweet spot in, in e-commerce and social, social marketing, um, email marketing. We're running a logistics warehouse like... We could do everything, really. And um, 
yeah, probably grew too quickly. So I, I, I finished up there in December in 2020 and um, started Backchat, which you know all about, Charlie. So you work there with me at Backchat. And I do. So that's Backchat Podcast, um, which is, you know, our sort of flagship podcast. But we've, um, I've probably got a bigger lens, a future lens there with Backchat Studios, which, which sit above Backchat. And we, we make content, if, uh, if I'm simple about it. So Backchat Podcast, but then... We run three or four other podcasts and adding a few few others to the network as well, which has been a huge learning experience. But um, yeah, it's something I really enjoyed. You know, working working on an independent um, nature like that, um, building content, building your own content. Like every minute I put into it is for direct benefit of myself. Whereas if you're working, you know, I work across radio, TV, print. I do all of that, but all of it's for for someone else. You're working for the man basically. So. The independent nature of what we do with back chat um, is what's appealing to me. Yeah. So you, you start back chat when you're still at the club um, yeah. a few years ago, but then you kind of revived it last year. I want to say. Yep. Um, when does podcasting and media actually look like a career to you? When does it start to shape up? Well, I can go even further back than that. I actually drove through the parkland over here in Subi to get here, and I drove the park just over over this side here. Um, we used to record Eagle Vision, which was my first exposure to ch- like um, TV hosting. So it was a Channel Seven show, and uh, it was I was raw. I used to get a piece of paper and trying to memorise my lines and to say hello, Will Schofield, Eagle Vision. This is this is what's coming up on the show. It used to take me twenty minutes to spit it out right, and I used to be perfectionist. But like what it taught me was you don't actually need to be perfect, and you know just having a conversation with someone is is easier. You know. You don't, you don't try and remember lines when you walk into a restaurant or a business uh, situation or environment. So it started there. Um, I've, always, I've always enjoyed media through my whole career. Um, uh, I always told the media team at West Coast, literally, that there's, there's no situation you can't put me in. Uh, I didn't have the star power that you know, Nana Nui, Ashui, those sort of guys had through their careers. But I always, again, it's not arrogance, it's confidence. I always confidently felt my media talent was better than anyone there and if anything ever happened like I can talk about anything I've, I've, I've been honest through my career I've been um, up front with anything that's ever happened and I think that's sort of what I've tried to you know parlay into what I do now into you know regular media is be honest um, say it how it is and you know that way you don't really have any questions to answer because you, you're just being yourself yeah back chats developed a lot um, since your footy career ended what do you think is the biggest development you've made personally with it? Oh, um, I mean, having you on board, Charlie, has been a very big help. Um, shout out, Charlie. Uh, look, um, I mean, one thing that is difficult when you're running your own business because, you know, people think with a podcast, especially monetizing a pod- podcast, so you can go and do a podcast and, you know, not talking about this one in particular, but you can do a podcast, sit the microphones down, do a podcast, that's a podcast, right? But... But we, we do do more than that. You know, we're, we're fully sponsored. Um, we, we, we do run effectively a TV show and a radio show all in one and we don't need a satellite to transmit it. And we've monetized it. You know, we, we hire staff. We get people involved. It's not just Dan and I as my, my partner. So probably the biggest evolution is, you know, getting good people around you and, and using people to, to, to help you. Not using, but like really um, accepting people's help and working with people. It's been, yeah, it's been pretty cool. And, you know, the independent nature too that I spoke about, it's just, it's just good to be able to control the narrative a bit, which is a bit what we talk about at Backchat is I've sort of seen 14 years of the same old jargon rolled out in media land, especially sporting media. And it's been good to be able to sort of add a bit of a different voice to what we do there, I suppose. Yeah. We're just about done here. A couple more questions for you. Sad, I don't want to leave. Some reflection questions. Anything you might change along the way? No, no. Not a lot of regrets. Um, There's there's always always regrets in life. I'm I'm sure everyone has moments that they'd change if they could, but at the end of the day, you can't. Like, you can only deal with what what you've done and you can only control what's going to happen in the future. So... um, yeah, there's certainly been things that I would have done better if I had the chance, but you don't. So, yeah, I do I do live that sort of life that, um, you know, it's in the public eye, um, whether it be on the football field. You know, I, I headbutted someone in my last, last year of footy. Now, 
um, saying that, does that sound like it's a positive thing? No. But, you know, shit happens. So, and, and that's like, it's a bit of an analogy for life, really, in, in a sense. Like, things are going to happen that you, you don't, not proud of or um, you can't necessarily control, but it's how you actually just behave after it and whether you show um, compassion for others that you've harmed in the way or, you know, positive things as well. It's like, how, how do you, how do you, you know, continue to do positive things and, and be a better person. So I um, kind of forgot what question you asked, but, yeah, just rambling a little bit. Don't worry. We, we've got one more. Okay. Uh, a bit of a hypothetical for you. 15-year-old Scoey sitting in front of you. What advice do you give him? <sighs> Charlie, that's good, mate. Um, oh, yeah, geez, there's a lot of things you'd love to know as a 15-year-old that I know now. Yeah. Um, uh, de- definitely, some, you know, uh, li- listening to others um, and, and, you know, forging your own path's great, but other people do know better than you. And I've always been pretty pig-headed in the way I do things and my way's the, the right way and been pretty bullish about aspirations with either footy career or business or whatever it is. But in the end, there'll always be someone that knows better than you. So as a 15-year-old, 16, 17-year-old, 18, 19 There'll be people in your life that you can actually listen to and their advice will be helpful. So listen. Well, that's how you got here, Scoey. Did we miss anything? Plenty. Plenty. Pl- plenty. There's, but there's a lot we can't cover in half an hour, but I think we got a good picture of you. This has been How Did I Get Here. Thank you for joining me today, Scoey. You can find us, student underscore edge on Instagram, student edge one word on TikTok. Search us up, student edge on YouTube or how did I get here on YouTube and head to studentedge.org for articles, podcasts, deals, competitions, career tips, education advice and much, much more. Scoey, thank you for joining me. Love all that people.